let's move on to our first Attitudes of Programmatic a review of 2024 results and what to expect in 2025. Stephanie, uh, Gregor, I would say please come and join me on stage, but come and join me virtually and we'll get going. I mean, thank you so much for sharing all these kind of insights with me. That's been really interesting, fascinating. And yeah, you can read the full kind of reports and get it from IB Europe. And with that, I again hand it over to you, Wayne. Perfect. Thank you very much. And I think for those of you in the room today, I think um, we're going to share a slide a bit later on, but you'll actually be one of the first to be able to review this uh, report. So we'll share the QR code with you uh, later today. So let me first of all, welcome our panels. To kick things off, I'm going to call on each of you. Please introduce yourself and just give us a bit of an overview of which stat resonated with you or really surprised you the most. And we'll start with Stephanie. Yeah, hi, I'm Stephanie Scanamilio. I work for Microsoft. Obviously, we're an advertiser, a publisher, but we're also an ad tech company. I work in our ad tech part for the EMEA buy side. So we're servicing agencies and brands on how to leverage our invest DSP and our curate technology. When I looked at the report, I was actually surprised by the drop that you also called out about a key driver for programmatic being automation and also reducing oper or improving operational efficiency. I feel like it's a year where a lot of focus goes into operational efficiency and the opportunities that we can have, and especially programmatic with APIs that are like simplifying the access to the platforms are really like prone to invest in, in these areas and to reduce a lot of reliance on sending emails back and forth for sellers or like waiting, like the technology never goes on PTO. So I feel like we're underestimating that opportunity a bit. Completely agree. Gregor. Yeah, hello. My name is Gregor Fellner. I'm the senior director for media in the Dach region in Eastern Europe for a good advertising. We are monetizing Raccoon TV and other CTV apps and driving this new programmatic topic forward here in Europe. And when I contributed to the study, I was a little bit surprised about the fact that the sustainability topic has taken a backseat on it to the economic pressure. I think when I remember it correctly, 60% of advertisers were saying they're, they're still investing and in, in a top priority in this topic, which is 20% year over year decrease. And I found it quite sad, but yeah, and it will be, of course, interesting to see how this will evolve through 2025. Perfect. Thank you, Gregor. Sylvia? Yes, yeah, Sylvia ivaneko Sajewska. I am part of the Decentric team, one of the leading data cleaning providers in, in Europe. And I am heading the German market, driving new partnerships and extending the existing partnerships. Yeah, what resonated with me from, from this report, I think considering the broaden context of this report and its 10th edition, which is pretty much like amazing testament to the industry and all the efforts we have put together to, to drive the programmatic advertising. It was pretty much alarming for me to see that the drop of a percentage of advertisers who are buying media prog programmatically. I think we have, the, the drop was like two digit, two, digit, two digit one, and we are at the level of 2022. So I would consider this as a quiet big uh, disruption for our industry. But on the other side, to bring some more positivity into, into the uh, report, it was very much interesting to see that demand partners, if these are agencies or brands, learned to diversify the data strategies. So the dependency of third party data has become less. And this is very much exciting thing. So from the one side, we have this disruption and I would say the call to actions we can bring or define together. And on the other side, the positivity that brands learned and agencies learned and publishers learned how important first party data and first party data strategies are. Sylvia, you, you raise a really good point. I think from my perspective, it, I feel like there's been a lot of volatility, especially around the open market and trust in the open market this year with everything that's been going on around transparency and cookie deprecation. Um, but we'll dig into that a bit later. Thank you very much. Um, Xavier. Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Xavier Yerina. And I'm in charge of the international marketplace strategy at Freewheel. That means I look after our demand partnerships teams as well as our marketplace operations teams. I think the stat that surprised me the most is similar to Sylvia to see a decrease 
in the programmatic share for advertisers. Even though maybe the decrease is not massive, I'm still surprised to see any decrease at all, and particularly in this play. And yeah, I think it's just a reminder for us as an industry that we can't get complacent if we want to continue on our growth trajectory. Yeah, completely. Let's move on to our new question, just conscious of time. So whilst programmatic investment continues to grow year on year, we're now seeing the growth rate slow down. This really highlights the maturation of the market and the number one barrier to investment highlighted by all stakeholder groups was quality of media. With this in mind, do you agree that quality of media should be addressed both on the sell side and buy side? And is it a deciding factor? And can we expect investment to return to the growth level seen in 2023? And I'm going to come to Stephanie on this one. Yeah, I think everyone in this room and, and digitally joining hope, hopes that the investment returns to the levels. I would say that uh, with the 10th edition, 10 years ago, we were already discussing about this topic very heavily. I think we've made a lot of progress since then. But there is a bit of a, a challenge when it comes to quality of media in that when media dollars are being spent, obviously, agencies and brands, they want to have all the best of everything. So there's a lot of multidimensional thinking. And ideally, you want to hit KPIs across a broad grid of, of things that you're observing. And there's a risk that you don't have the priorities clear. So if, if quality was your main priority, then you could probably achieve that. But it's conflicting with ROI. It's conflicting with other objectives that are being tried to reach. And I think at the end of the day, the money is not necessarily put where the words are being put. A lot of times we see, for example, um, you're getting rid of a, a certain supply source that was not quality, but then the advertiser still ex expects all the KPIs to hit the same threshold or to even grow on that. But you just cut out something that you were buying because it was emulating the good performance. Mm -hmm. So you should also adjust your expectations. And I think sometimes there's a bit of a hesitancy to allow for that growth mindset of my KPIs might get worse if I'm actually prioritizing this correctly, because that was driving up false clicks, that was driving up undesired behavior, but it was making my report look so nice and so good. So I think there is a, a task to really look at the expectations and the value and kind of like the prioritization of where you want to put your money. So I would say it's an ongoing concern, but it ultimately should start from the from the perspective of what do you value in media dollars being spent and what do you expect in return? Stephanie, I, I would like to second you, to second you on, on the point that quality is multifaceted and then you have, of course, to balance the KPIs versus quality sometimes. And speaking or coming from an area which grows also according to the report quite heavily, CTB, I think quality plays also a pivotal role in this uh, space. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if this is the reason why it grows. I think it's one reason. The other is, of course, that uh, TV uh, usage is different as in the past. And the quality in uh, CTV is, of course, also multifaceted. So you have long-form content, which is brand safe, which is good. You have good targeting uh, capabilities. You have this safe environment. So this is probably also a driver who drives money to, to this area. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I think if, if we look at, you hit a really key word there, safe environment, or two key words there. I think if we look at kind of curation, for example, I feel like curation is a bit of a reflection of the lack of trust in safety and stability within the ecosystem at the moment. And I think that's why we've seen such a huge rise in that area this year. Let me also quickly ask Xavier to weigh in on this one. Yeah, I think <clears throat> to answer your question, I believe that quality of media needs to be addressed by both sides, right? by both the buy and sell side. I think the reason for the quality of media discussion right, are the fundamental changes that we are seeing in the industry. On the one hand, the industry's identity backbone is being redefined by cookie deprecation. Mm -hmm. Then on the other hand, we have the rise of CTV, which has a much higher concentration of sell side participants. And all of that changes the supply and demand dynamics. And in a way, we are moving from a place where quality was maybe secondary, as long as certain performance KPIs were hit, right? And Stephanie, you just mentioned that, to now a place where quality is becoming more important again as measurement and attribution are changing. 
Therefore, Therefore, I think both sides need to find answers to what quality of media means within this new paradigm, right? And that will require moving out of their comfort zone mm -hmm. and making some compromises, right? And by that, changing to how things used to work in the past, which is always a bit uncomfortable. And now when you look at CTV specifically, I think the sell side needs to improve some of the signal density if we want to continue to see growth. But then on the buy side as well, there will need to be some adjustments to the way of buying media and an understanding that more of the decisioning will live on the sell side compared to what it used to be in the past. Right? And you mentioned curation, I think seller defined audiences, like these are all examples of that trend. So yeah, I think it requires both sides. If I can afford uh, one comment here, maybe while we are speaking about the quality of media and we are still in the industry, a uh, programmatic industry where we, from the beginning, we have been speaking about reaching the, uh, the correct user. I think we should extend the discussion also to the quality of the users you can find behind the single publishers. This is the conversations we also need to have, not only the media, but who are the quality audiences behind the single publishers and, and media spaces who are planning uh, for uh, media campaign executions. Perfect. Thank you all. Let's move on to the next question. The survey highlighted that two of the top drivers for advertiser investment in programmatic were the ability to discover audiences and granularity of controls and transparency of reporting. How do these align with your personal and your respective businesses' points of view on what drives advertiser investment in programmatic? And we're going to stay with Sylvia on that one. As a data cleanroom provider, I will, of course, I loved uh, to see uh, this report reflecting on advertisers <laughs> relying on the new audience insights. Once again, if you think about what what are the what is the nature what is the dna of, of the programmatic advertising what is the big promise we have delivered as an industry to our brands and publishers like addressing the proper user the same uh, at the proper time with the proper message i think we with all the new technologies which has been developed across the 10 years we have missed the quiet essential momentum like how the media consumption change and while we spoke about addressability or about the sustainability for instance we missed the key momentum that users totally change the, how they consume the media. I would say as a newcomer on the blog, which I would consider the, the data cleanroom providers, we are happy to contribute to the new era of programmatic and serving stakeholders within the entire industry. These are advertisers, agencies, or publishers with the media ins or audience insights, which can be gen generated with this new technology. I'm a big fan of data clean rooms. I think we've come a long way since hashing data out on spreadsheets. Do you feel like enough companies and businesses understand the use cases and how data clean rooms can be used to address the, these concerns and issues? Very fair point. When we speak about programmatic being live for 10, 15 years, data clean rooms history is pretty much shorter than the wider programmatic industry. Mm -hmm. So we speak here of perspective of five years. Uh, and when you then consider the starting point and the, the momentum we are having right now, I would say the industry recognize the added value we as a technology can provide to, uh, to all stakeholders. Once again, if these are advertisers, agencies or publishers across all the different use cases we can help with, if these are um, audience insights, measurement, or just simply better targeting. So um, from the status point of the conversations we're having in the key markets in Europe, and we are covering multiple markets uh, in, in the European, in, in EMEA, I would say, Finally, data clean rooms became the essential bridge mm -hmm. and the existing, or we are an essential part of this entire EdTech and MarTech stack and not the technical island anymore. I like it. Thank you. Let's come to Gregor. Yeah, what we also see more and more, and you just have spoken about a very high good in our industry, which is trust. And trust comes through transparency and reporting, especially in the in-app environment. And we are speaking about in-app environment on CTV devices. You need this very high degree of transparency when it comes uh, to reporting. And this leads then to better targeting uh, capabilities. So 
as you may all know, in CTV, the contextual targeting uh, is, is uh, predominant. And um, we, we are now seeing that there is a trend to you know, go beyond this and, and see uh, other ways, uh, signal density increase to get more and more reporting and more transparency on what kind of signal I'm, am I getting and what user am I getting. So also the net reach measurement initiatives from the IAB and others are leading and paying into this. Yeah, I think that's what the report has just shown a very key development uh, that we as an industry should, you know, put in our workbook for the next years. Indeed. Thank you, Gregor. And Stephanie? Yeah, I think when it comes to discovering audiences, the, the programmatic environment obviously just allows for a lot more reporting capabilities. There's a lot more signals that you get when you run a campaign on a DSP versus when you have a, a direct publisher that gives you like an end of campaign reporting. And there is also the advantage that you can pull this data at any point, you can react to it. So you don't have to wait until your budget is delivered and you get the follow-up report to then take a decision. You can upweight what works well, you can stop what doesn't work. Uh, and when it comes to discovering audiences, also there is just like more audiences available. Most platforms have like wide data marketplaces to make third party data accessible. They're integrating data cleaning rooms and other technologies to do like more privacy first data matching. And in our case, like we've recently, not so recently, some time ago, we've, we started to expose our first party data as Microsoft also through our DSP. And it just allows to have that connection between ownership of reporting and like being in control of where you spend your money, but then also using all these data signals for some data mining and just like to discover other things. And I think at the end of the day, we're talking about different types of data. We're talking about discovering and, and seeing like an evolving landscape and where we have like more fixed package. I feel like programmatic is like building blocks and data is one of those building blocks. So is inventory, so is like brand safety. And I think the flexibility is just bigger in these uh, environments because it allows more players to participate. Perfect. Thank you very much. Let's move on to our next question. We've, it's actually come up a lot in today's conversation already, but CTV was cited as a key growth remit by both advertisers and publishers, um, whilst agencies chose digital out of home, ad tech and uh, retail media. What do you see as the priority growth area in the next six to 12 months? And we'll start with Gregor on this one. Of course, we, we are dealing with CTV all the time. And you may think, okay, you, you just serve in-stream video. But we just learned from Stephanie and, and the whole panel that there is so much more to do in the programmatic space. But also when you think of this as a channel and on, uh, think of the device, there's also much more coming in the, in the next years or months. So this big screen can also be used, for instance, for display, for interaction with the user. This big screen is already used for watching uh, traditional TV and fast channels. So the growth of fast is also a, a big grow area for uh, programmatic, uh, as this leads, of course, to a lot of inventory. And yeah, we are producing more and more fast channels in-house with recruiting business solutions. And we'll see that this will foster an even bigger growth and get more and more inventory out there. So Gregor, just because you come from Rakuten, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit and <clears throat> ask you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you think CTV in Europe has the potential to achieve the same share of investment on a European scale as it does in the US, and if so, what do you see as the key triggers to make this happen? I think it depends on country to country. In, in Germany, definitely we need the currency, the old currency discussion. So going back to the user, who are we reaching with this one too many yeah, channel? That's definitely a driver, plus um, some interaction uh, capabilities from the users interacting with the advertising. I think these are the key overspanning drivers yeah, to get close to the CTV spend in, in the US. Cool. We don't need more players. We don't need more players. There are plenty out there who could do the job. Perfect. Thank you. And Sylvia? Yeah, I would pretty much to echo Gregor, maybe like zooming out why we see this tremendous uh, CTV growth. It's pretty much because like how, once again, users change their content consumption, right? 
I would see this as a continued growth the industry is already in. So we don't see CTV growth in this last year, but it's continued growth and it will continue growing. I would wish, and this is how I see this emergency in the upcoming six to uh, um, 12 months, is having CTV buying being more sophisticated from the user perspective. So what Gregor called with, with this currency user, yeah? So who we... Who are the audiences behind this big screen to really then empower better decisions on the advertiser t uh, side? And this, uh, this belief that any media decision is make, being made a proper, properly. Investing in all the technologies like privacy enhancing technologies, if this is data cleaner of other data technologies, to empower better CTV buying are a must have and an emergency from my stand, um, point of view. Thanks. I would like to interject there because I think, yeah, we have a finite set of players in the area and we want to have like an evolving buying opportunity. But I think there's still a, a lack of um, technical standardization, especially in the CTV space. So I think like a, a big obstacle is that the type of signals that are being passed on and the type of integrations, they're still very fragmented, which makes it very hard to have that unified buy across a number of publishers and to have that comparability of the signals that you're getting and then it also like ties back into the story of how do i integrate ctv into the rest of my marketing plan if i have like disparate signals or i have like different identities i think there is also like a technological gap compared to the general programmatic market i think stephanie hit it on the head this i was about to interject myself on this point i think if we look at mobile for example until we had the open SDK, everyone was doing it themselves. I feel like for CTV, we need to find a uniform way to measure across the industry. And until we get there, I feel like it's there is a barrier there, a technological barrier to actually scaling up from an investment perspective. Xavier? So I agree with the continued growth in CTV. And I think a particular growth area, though, will be the programmatic monetization of live events. And so this will require building out the capabilities both on buy and sell side to support a high concurrent viewership. And so basically, and the resulting high QPS that, that come from that. And this work is something which we are starting to see. Now, why do I think we will see an increase in life and programmatic in particular? Audiences are shifting, obviously, from linear TV to streaming devices. And that is also true for live events. And as programmers follow this shift, it basically has benefits for all sides. For the advertisers, it gives them more ways to access live programming without massive budgets and therefore opens up the opportunity for new advertisers to enter and then hopefully also more targeting possibilities i think for the programmers it just gives them more platforms and distribution avenues to offer to advertisers and also the possibility to show multiple events simultaneously or different events and then for the viewer obviously it's more like the more possibilities to view the content they like. And yeah, those are the, the benefits I see across everyone. And I think that is a, will be a growth area for, for next year. Perfect. We've got five minutes left, team. So I'm just going to move on to the final question. Keep it nice and punchy. Uh, what are your predictions for 2025 and what buzzwords and topics will shape the industry? And let's stay with uh, Xavier on this one. Yeah, sure. So as I just mentioned, first one, I think live events and programmatic is going to be an important and big to topic as well as a huge untapped opportunity. I think my Second prediction is that the topic around auction duplication will be much discussed and there will be discussions around how to improve on it. Is it more like changing the incentives on the buy side? Is it more like an enforcement driven sell side change or like an industry body driven initiative? Mm -hmm. And I think my third prediction for next year is related to what Gregor was already alluding to, which is I think with the shift from linear to streaming, this calling for new creative. And so I expect that next year we will see a lot of new CTV 
ad formats being implemented in CTV environments. This could be like shoppable ads, binge ads, pause ads, and I think there will also be a lot of experimentation with things like AI for user like profile. It. So yeah, uh, those are my predictors, predictions <laughs> for Think 25. Sounds good. Sylvia. Sylvia? Yeah, I wouldn't be representing data clean the room today if I wouldn't say that my big guess is um, advertisers will continue uh, investing into first party data strategies to um, uh, empower and enable better and more sophisticated media buying in the future. Um, with the fact that we saw agencies relying um, or very much relying on efficiency, I would also consider in regard of agencies uh, being more mindful and becoming more mindful uh, when it comes to um, a more sophisticated media buying and being more um, or less, sorry, less dependent on third party uh, cookies and um, continue yeah, with diversified um, data strategies and first party data becoming a big focus. And for the publishers, I would say as these were the, the stakeholders in the entire industry who has recognized the emergency of third party cookies deprecating and uh, building very fast first party data strategies, those publishers are making use and even better monetization uh, of first party data. So these are the three pillars for Thank 2025. Thank you. Got so. two minutes left. Gregor, quickly, your ones. <laughs> yeah. uh, Xavier had um, already mentioned a lot of uh, trends, and I hope to, to get um, off the panel without AI. Uh, mentioning AI, <laughs> you did it. Uh, so I, I, will, I would like to use a different buzzword, and it's a safe rooms. We have spoken about clean rooms, but it will be a safe room. Will the oh, I like it. thematic space be a safe room in 2025 to, for advertisers and brands to advertise? Will it be free? I think we, we all will be uh, driven from developments in the US and I, I'm, I'm, I will remember this panel, I'm pretty sure that we talked about brand safety and how we can advertise in a safe room. Perfect. And Stephanie? Yeah, I think I would go back to your example of the live events and I hope that there can be a bridge to also have like more emphasis on gaming and sports because I think esports is an enormously interesting sector with a lot of eyeballs, a lot of increased money involved and i would hope that gaming enters the horizon in 2025 even more than it's been in the past we've heard at the beginning that in the app space already gaming is obviously on mobile it's, it's very prominent and a big driver for revenue but i hope that can also happen for the big screens in a new way perfect and i'm gonna go with my buzzword for next year which is going to be anti cookie apocalypse i think that's <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be for next year thank you very much we have one question from the audience i'm going to stick with stephanie on this one just for a second um it, the question is and i just had it where is it um how do you define a measure quality now being from dv i know how i define a measure quality stephanie how do you define a measure quality the quality of a given measure for a campaign. I would say at the end of the day, uh, a good measure or a good KPI should really represent business goals. And the closer that it is to actually driving revenue for your company, the, the less easy it is to fake and to insert fraud. So I would say measurement should try to really emulate business value and move away from, I think a click is very superficial. It's very easy to fake. A bot can click, but a bot will not buy your product. So I think there is obviously along the funnel, there are different measurements. We're working on, for example, uplift measurements that connect programmatic spend to search, search events, search is very close to the buy, to the actual conversion. There are other ways to do this. I think surveys have been underutilized. Initially, we had a lot of momentum about building like online surveys to understand like uplift and stuff. I think this is going to have a reemergence. And then again, just like understanding the audience, as you mentioned, and the hit on an audience that's both for CTV planning, but that's also for like other media activations. Mm -hmm. It's really more about having a good quality measurement of the ad lending where you want it to end and maybe less about focusing on the more superficial actions sometimes. Perfect. Thank you very much. We've gone two minutes over, so I took a little bit of a liberty there. But for those in the audience, please can we have a massive round of applause for our panellists on our first panel for today. And Jörg, back over to you. Thank you all for your partnership. Thank you for your panel.